a series of lessons that I really want to kind of call a getting to know you and you getting to know me type of lesson. So they're fundamental, foundational teachings that I believe that we as the body of Christ have in common. And this is really, it's tied into what I would do with a next steps class if I was teaching a new convert. As far as just these are things that we have fundamental beliefs that we have com in common. And the apostles talked about having a common salvation. And I think it's important that we have that same common salvation and that we understand some of that same common salvation that we have. And I know that I could be preaching to those of you that have heard it for your entire life. And that's okay, because every once in a while it's good to have a review and a, re a reminder. But not only that, if you're that strong in it, then this may be just what pushes you over the edge, because very soon I want many of you to start teaching Bible studies and teaching others as well. And so what I'm doing tonight may very well be what you are doing on a one-on-one -on -one basis or with a small group yourself very soon. So take notes and see yourself as the one that is the one that can present this as well as the one that just absorbs this, if that's okay tonight, all right? So in the beginning, the first lesson I said God had a plan. And this week I want to talk how that plan is fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Okay, our key verses, John chapter 1, verse 1. We used this last week, but again, it, I'm going to use this one again. In the beginning was the Word. We said last week that that word, the Greek, was logos, and it means, among other things, it means the plan or the thought of God. So in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And then we're going to go to John chapter 1, verse 14, and it says, And the word, that word that was God, was made flesh. And dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, and it was full of grace and of truth. Jesus Christ is filled with grace and he's filled with truth. And that is the word manifest in the flesh, Jesus Christ. So last week we said that there's one God. And that this one God is revealed throughout all of nature. And also he's revealed by the word of God. And we used a lot of scriptures. We used Isaiah chapter 43 verses 10 and 11 which says, Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant whom you... I have chosen that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, neither shall there be after me. It goes on to say, I even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. Okay, so there's no Savior besides the Almighty God. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4, we really stress this as being something that every one of a Jewish persuasion, the followers of Abraham would understand those of the Mosaic law that this was the key foundational belief. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And when they ask Jesus what is the greatest of all the commandments, he says this is the greatest commandment. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so we understand that this basis of one God is very well established within the word of God and that we if we are going to be Christians and believers of this word then we have to understand that there's one God and that's very foundational and very basic but in addition to being one God the word also is going to reveal a lot of other attributes about this God and in addition to being understanding that he's one God he's also a spirit now what's a spirit now, all of us kind of understand that, especially when we talk about the Holy Spirit, because that is the Spirit of God. That is very much the Spirit of God. So when we talk about the Holy Ghost and the Holy Spirit, we're talking about God, because we're talking about the one who is a spirit. Okay, so what is a spirit? Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it, right at the beginning, we start talking about a spirit. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And right there, in the midst of all that darkness, the Word of God tells us, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the deep. So what is this Spirit? Well, Jesus kind of told us what the Spirit was not in Luke chapter 24, verse 39. He had been resurrected, and he appeared before his apostles and his disciples, and they were a little bit shook up. They were wondering if they were seeing a ghost. They were wondering about this Spirit thing. And he wanted to assure them that he was more than a Spirit, that he actually had a body. 
And he goes on to say, Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see. For a spirit hath not flesh and bones as you see me have. So you can see me. I have hands. I have feet. You can feel me. I've got flesh. I've got bones. That's not a spirit. So sometimes we understand what a spirit is by understanding what a spirit isn't. Okay? The Word of God goes on to say in John chapter 1 that no man hath seen God at any time. And why is this? Because he is an invisible spirit. So we understand that God himself has never been seen by any man. That's according to the Word of God. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So we're going to understand, we're going to begin to talk today about the Son of God, who is the representation of the Almighty God. Okay? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 17 says, Now unto the King eternal. We're talking about the Almighty God. He's King of kings and he's Lord of lords. He's eternal. He has no beginning and he has no ending. In addition to that, he's immortal. He can't die. God cannot die, okay? In addition to this, he's invisible. That's what we think of with the spirit, right? But yet we can see the essence and the power of that spirit working in so many ways within our lives. He's the only wise God, and to him be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. A few other significant attributes of God's revealed in the Bible is tied into a word called, uh, uh, words that begin with the, suffix of omni like omnipotent or omnipotent and omni is the greek and it means i didn't write it down and my mind is playing tricks on me today sometimes that goes with covid i'm blaming covid for this one <laughs> all right is that right all powerful okay so he's the all potent or all powerful god also omnipresent that means that he, he's everywhere and then omniscient, which means that he knows and he sees everything. And there's scripture that backs this up. Genesis chapter 17, verse 1 is the first time when God declared himself to be the Almighty. And Abram was 90 and 9 years old. The Lord appeared to him and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. I'm the Almighty God. Other people, other gods claim to be gods. Other people claim to have a God that may be the God of the harvest or the God of the seas or the God of the sky or the God of the sun or the moon. He says, I'm the almighty God. I want you to walk before me and be perfect. And in the last days, and I believe that we're living very much in the last days, many are going to acknowledge him as the almighty. Revelation, if we go from Genesis, go clear up to the last book of the Bible in Revelation chapter 19, verse 6. Records, and I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude. That's a whole lot of people. And he goes on to describe what this great multitude of people are doing. When we were praying here just a little bit, I kind of felt like there was a little bit of uh, upswelling within me and within you as we began to worship God. And there was something that just began to kind of bubble out. And I kind of think when you get to heaven, there's going to be that maybe magnified ten times, a hundred times, I don't know, a million times over. And it begins to talk about this voice and these people as they begin to worship God. And as the voice of many waters. That's like the roaring of the ocean. That's like the roaring of a sea as it rushes past you. Of many waters and as the voice of mighty thunderings. Everyone ever hear thunder and lightning and it just seems so loud, especially when it's close? So we're hearing a voice of, many, of a great multitude. It's like many waters and it's many thunderings. And what they're saying is, hallelujah, that's the highest praise that we can give to God. So as they begin to worship and this upswelling of noise and a worship begins to go forward to God, they say, for the Lord God omnipotent, the almighty God reigns. And so there's something as you realize the greatness and the power of this God that we're talking about, that there is going to be come a time that as we see him and as we, as he is revealed to us in a greater and greater way, there's going to be something within each and every one of us that we're going to begin to uplift him and magnify him in a way that we never had before. And that's why many times when we come into this house and as we begin to lift up the name of Jesus, and we begin to magnify him as the King of kings and the Lord, there is that same upswelling of worship. And every time that we come here, you and I have an obligation and a responsibility to begin to lift him up in that way so that someone else can come into this presence and they realize that I'm in the presence of the Almighty God. We don't just come here together for ourselves, but we're here to magnify him. We're here to lift him up and to glorify him and to worship him. And as we do that, 
His presence comes down, and that's where the ministry of the Word and of the Spirit begins to make a difference in your life and in my life and in those that we've invited to join us in this presence. And that's really why we come together and why we invite others to join, because we really want them to come into the presence of the Almighty God. Talking about the omnipotent God, Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 17, Jeremiah said, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power. That's a lot of power. And stretch out arm, and there's nothing that's too hard for you. In other words, you haven't even really strained. You aren't even tired. You aren't even out of breath after you, after you get through with all of that. You know, I can't even talk for two minutes without being out of breath, but I'm talking about a God that's so great and so powerful that he can go on and on and he can create everything and he doesn't even break a sweat. Now, Brother Ike, you're a pretty strong man, but, you know, there comes a point where after a while even we get a little bit tired. Yeah. So you all know what I'm talking about with that, but we're talking about a God that is omnipotent, and not only that, but he's omniscient and he's omnipresent. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 3 says, the eyes of the Lord are in every place. You can't hide from him. There isn't anything that you can do, but he's going to catch it and he's going to see you. And he's beholding the evil and the good. He knows everything. So he sees everything and he knows everything. And that's the God that we're talking about because he fills all space. Not only does it fill all space, but he, he fills our, our hearts. And he, he knows the thoughts, the Bible says, the thoughts and the intents of our heart. Not just what we say, not just the front that we put on, but he knows really what's going on deep down inside each and every one of us. That's the God that we're talking about who is our creator. So the Bible reveals there's one God. He's a spirit. The spirit is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. And last week we also talked about how the, he's the creator. We talked about that creation, and on the first day there was light and there was darkness and the separation of that, and then the firmament, which was the heavens, and the waters were divided above and below the firmament and the sea and the land and the vegetation on the land, and that was day three. And then on day four he created the star and the suns and the moon. Kind of interesting, you have light on day one and the stars and the sun and the moon all created on day four because what God is talking about there's an illumination and there's a light that's greater than anything that you can ever know about just by looking at the light of this world or just by looking at these lights that are here today and that's the illumination that God brings into a light and that's the illumination that we get by his spirit and by his word the word of God says thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. It's important that we dig into that word. It's important that we understand that word because that's where we're going to find that true illumination in our light and that life and that true direction that we need. But not only that, day five, he went on and created the sea creatures and the birds. That's a whole lot of creating. And then he goes on day six and he does the cattle, the reptiles, and the beasts of the field. And then he just, it just seems like it's almost thrown in there. He also on day six, he creates man. And all this seems to take place on a zoomed out scale to where you can kind of see God doing all these things kind of like this. And you just kind of get a big overview of all that he's done. And even if you get through Genesis chapter 1, it's still just this big overview. But then all of a sudden when he starts talking about man, it seems like he kind of zooms in a little bit. Because this is really the key focus of what God has really created. He's created all of this for man. Because he talks about man having dominion over all this. So we zoom in and we begin to see that there's this backdrop of all of creation, but the focus and the main character is man. Okay? In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, God begins to talk about this. The Word of God does. And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. And there's a lot of people that will look at that verse and say, We'll say, God said, let us make man after our image. Let us make man after our image and after our likeness. And so at that point, they begin to say, well, there must be a trinity, and there must be more than one God, or there must be more than one persons within this God. Let's go ahead and just go to verse 27 and see if that would support that, because a scripture all, all by itself is kind of without strength unless it's going to be supported elsewhere, right? So let's go to verse 27, because we, last week we talked all over and over and over again about how there's one God, and he did all this stuff by himself, right? Did everyone remember that? So what does verse 27 say about this? Is it going to support verse 26? It says, so God created man in their image. Is that what it said? So God created man in his image. Let's go on. In the image of God created they him in the image of God created he him 
Male and female created they him. Male and f- so it seems to me like all of a sudden we've gone back to the singularity. Now, why is the Bible going to have plural in one verse and singular in the next? Well, if we go back to those people of God, those Hebrews, and those studies of this, the, the original believers, the Jews, and we ask them what this is all about, they're going to tell you that. You know how the Queen of England is going to speak, and she's going to say, we, and she's going to use plural in her speech because she's speaking for a kingdom? They're saying that same majesty and that form of majesty is exactly what God was doing as he was speaking as the almighty mighty creator of heaven and earth. And in his majesty, he's saying, let us create man in our image. Now, there's other reasons and thoughts and other thoughts behind that. But I just kind of think that the Bible pretty much consistently talks about one God. And so if there is a verse that does that, and if we can understand that, and if the very people of God, that the, the ones that have studied this and lived this for when we were all Jews and, and just outsiders and had nothing to do with it, if they're all going to believe it, that's what God said, and for 2,000 years, why would God have his chosen people of 2,000 years not understand something as basic as who he is? Does that make sense? Okay. So I know I'm preaching to the choir, but I kind of enjoy that because I kind of think God, how, how many men did God create? One. So he, he created one man in the image of God. So there's only one person that God created, and that one created person is the image of God. So therefore, there should only be one person in the Godhead. Is that all right? All right, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, God talks a little bit more about this. He gives us some additional details about this creation. He says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. A living soul. Man is composed of body and of soul and of spirit. Now, the body, in the beginning of that verse, it said, Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, the almighty God. God just reached down and took the most basic of all things that we as humans could understand is just some dust, just some dirt. And he said, from this, I'm going to make the greatest of all my creations. But I, with my hand, I am going to create something that is very special so that he can create something out of dust that no one else will ever be able to copy or emulate because he's that kind of a God. So a man is composed of body, soul, and spirit. The body, it's the physical substance, and it's those things that Jesus was telling his disciples. It's the hands, it's the feet, it's the skin, it's the bones, it's the muscles, it's the blood. That's the body. That's our body. The anatomy that you study, if you want to be a doctor, all those things that you have to take, that's the body that you're really talking about. And Jesus said his spirit doesn't have flesh and bones because that's the spirit. And this is, we're talking about now the, the body. And it's the house for the soul and for the spirit. And it's the part that we see all the time. And it's the part that we spend all of our time worrying about what it looks like. And it's this, the, you know, and the strength and everything that we, we, we're really talking most of the time about the body. And the body that it was formed from the dust is going to go back to the dust. God formed it. And this is the part that ultimately returns into dust. Okay. But there's also this part that's the soul and the spirit that makes up this inner man. And this is the will. This is your desire. This is where you say, I'm going to do something or I'm not going to do something. This is the part that's your intellect and your intelligence. And this is also the part that's our emotions and our personality. That's that part that when you really think about somebody, if you think about them apart from their facial expressions and everything else, it's that person that you know that's the inner person, the real person. And that's the soul. That's the soul that God created. And so along with this soul, there is also a spirit. And the spirit is the part that is able to connect with God in a way that nothing else can connect because God is a spirit. And if I am going to connect with God in a way that is unique and powerful, it's going to be because we have something in common and we're similar. So God created man to have a spirit that would be able to connect with him for all of eternity. And the very reason that we are here is because there is this spirit that God has created that he wants to join and to be a part and to be vital in understanding the very purpose of this inner relationship that he wants us to have with him. And so that spirit is created in such a way that for all of eternity, he wants us to spend eternity with him, his spirit with our spirit. Man is unique. 
And God didn't make us as a mechanical man. He didn't make us like an angel. The angels have more power. The angels are bigger. The angels can worship God 24-7. And when they shout and when they worship him, the very pillars of, of the temple are going to shake. And we aren't quite that way. But there's something about man that God created us to where he gives us, he makes us what we, we call a free moral agent. He gives us this ability to choose. And this is a power, and this is something that is very significant because it's what sets man apart from all of the rest of creation. It's there within this soul, within this will that we have, if you will, that God has created something very unique. That's this power of choice that allows us to choose to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. When we walked into, in here today with prayer, you could either choose to sit or you could choose to begin to let your spirit and your emotions and your soul begin to reach out to God in prayer. And those of us that did this, there was something that came down and there was a spirit of God and we felt refreshed and we felt that nearness of the spirit of God. And the more that we do this, the Bible says as you draw closer to God, he's going to draw closer to us. So we find that there's this beautiful relationship that we have and this is really what it's all about. But it's this power of choice. Somebody put it this way. If a man chooses to worship God, all the devils in hell cannot stop him. But they went on and said, if a man chooses to not worship God, all the angels in heaven cannot make him worship God. And because God has allowed us to have this great freedom of choice, and that's really what it is. It's a freedom of choice. Then God sees something and he receives more delight in us than all the rest of his creation because when we choose to worship him and to magnify him he understands that this is love and this is a relationship that is powerful and that's why it's so sweet and so special to God he doesn't have to create us that way but he created us in this very unique way and it's very important that we as the worshipers of the most high God understand that what we have is an opportunity to worship God in a way that nobody else can yeah, Jesus said, if these fail to worship me, the rocks are going to cry out, but the rocks aren't going to cry out the same way that I can cry out or that you can cry out. So we have this obligation to always bring worship into the very presence of God because this is something that God wants is this relationship that we have with him. And so in the very first three chapters of Genesis, the very beginning of the Bible, God, it's pretty obvious that God wanted this relationship with Adam and Eve. He created them in a state of total innocence. He placed them in the Garden of Eden. He told them they were going to be the gardeners there to dress it and to keep it. And the Bible indicates that he visited them every day. Adam and Eve met with God, and they spent time in his presence, the Bible says, in the cool of the evening. I don't know about you, but I kind of like to take a walk after a hot day and just kind of visit with, you know, those after, after you get through working. And I could see God saying, okay, now we've, we've done all this work thing. Work is not a bad thing. Work's actually a blessing if you have a job and if you're working. God actually created us to be productive. But after that time of work, there's that time of rest and rest, you know, that time of not only rest, but there was a time of communion with God where God would walk with them and the living spirit would express himself to them. And that's the amazing time that God wanted in each and every one of them. Now let's think about this. They were in a virtual paradise. And in a way that almost seems more than we can really understand, it was a place with no fear. No fear. Now, just think about all we see with people today with COVID and everything else. But this was a place with no fear. Not even those of us that don't have all the concerns of others. We still have some fears. You know, you may have a fear of heights. You may have a fear of the dark. You may have a fear of um, needles. I don't know. There's something that's going to get you, right? The boogeyman. <laughs> no fears. Not only no fears, but no worries. Think about that. No worries. Anybody ever go the last week without a single worry? No aches and no pains. None. None. You remember being young and maybe there was a day or two you, you didn't even remember having any aches or pains? And now as you get a little bit older, it just seems like it's a part of life and part of the... Anybody know what I'm talking about? But this virtual paradise had no fears, no worries, no aches and pains, no discouragement. Everything that you did, you did well. Everything that you tried for, you were successful with. Think about it. No defeat. No guilt. No regrets because of past failures. We'd have to say they lived in perfect health and harmony with all of their surroundings. What a life. What a great life. 
And in all of this life, there was one thing that God said. In all of the midst of this garden that he had created, with man being the very focal point of everything that's taken place there, he says, there's one other thing that I want because of this unique ability of you to choose. I have to give you a choice. And if I'm going to give you a good choice, I also have to give you a choice that's not a good choice. And so we find that throughout all of this, you have good choices and not so good. So in Genesis chapter 2, verse 16, God puts this choice before man. And he says, the Lord God commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. You can eat of anything. That's my kind of smorgasbord. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. There's this one tree that's poisoned, so stay away from it. It sounds like a pretty easy choice, doesn't it? And, you know, really, if that would have been the end of, the, of all of that situation, that probably would have been a pretty easy choice. But, you know, sometimes there's a, something else called a temptation that comes into life. You can know that you're not supposed to do something, but it just seems like there's some, a situation changes a little bit, and it becomes a little bit more appealing, a little bit more of a temptation. So Genesis chapter 3 starts with this temptation. It says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made, and he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You should not eat of every tree of the garden? Did God say you're not supposed to eat of everything? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. But of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, You should not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. God didn't actually say you couldn't touch it, but she heard it from the man, and he probably was trying to protect her. And sometimes the man of God is going to say some things, and it may, not, it may be just to keep you from touching something that otherwise may cause you to die, even though God didn't say you couldn't touch it. Does that make sense? All right, because we don't want to die, right? So it's all right when that happens sometimes. And the serpent said unto the woman, you shall not die. Now God said you're going to die. Adam said you're going to die. And the serpent says you're not going to die. So now we have you, have, you have a choice. Who am I going to believe? Am I going to believe God or am I going to believe the serpent? Now who's the serpent? In Revelation chapter 12, verse 6, we come to understand that that serpent was the Satan and devil, and the devil. Okay? So you want to believe God or do you want to believe the devil? Now all of us here today, if I ask you just that basic question, you're all going to say, I want to believe God. But sometimes it seems like when it's not quite that obvious what the word of the devil and what the word of God is. Sometimes we kind of get confused on some of that too, don't we? The serpent said to the woman, you shall not die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, when your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods, you're going to know good and evil. So here's a temptation. And Satan always uses deception. And he always uses a lie. He's the father of all lies, the Bible said. He suggested to her that she's being deprived. If you really look, about, look at it, let me go back to that fifth verse. He said, you shall not surely die, for God doth know. God knows that in the day that ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and, all, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He didn't just say you're not going to die, but he's saying God knows something, and he's keeping this from you because he doesn't love you as much as you think he does, and he wants something, and that's really what happens as far as when we come up against something that's contrary to the word of God, and young people listen to me because that's going to happen in your life. You're going to think mom and dad are telling you you can't do this because they don't love you, and mom and dad's doing it because they love you, and they know that when you do it, it's going to cause problems in your life. And the word of God is going to do the same thing with you. But that same enemy is going to tell you it doesn't matter and you're not going to die. And they're really keeping you from something that's good. Because God's, he's, he's saying God wants, he knows that when you eat this you're going to have a superior knowledge. So now you have to make a choice. Who am I going to believe? Am I going to believe God or am I going to believe the serpent? Genesis chapter 3 verse 6 says, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. So she said, I have to make a choice. So now let me use my intellect to try to figure out what the right choice is. So when she came to this point, she said, the tree is good for food. It's pleasant to the eyes. I like what, you know, you're eating it. It looks okay, and it looks okay. And not only that, but it's desired to make one wise. I'm listening to you, and I'm believing what you see, what you say. So now I see what you believe. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. She made a choice. We all know she made the wrong choice. The next verse says, and the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. As soon as they ate, then at that point, everything changed. 
As soon as they made that choice, and so many times you make a choice and you think it's a good choice until you make it, and then you ever have those choices you make, and as soon as you make it, ah, I shouldn't have done that. Uh huh. And that's exactly probably what they felt as well. Now, I want to point out the original sin had three categories, and it's common to all and each and every one of us. If we go to 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, John wrote and said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Nobody wants to not, nobody wants to love the world. Nobody wa doesn't want the love of God in them, right? But the next verse goes on to talk about how this is going to happen in our lives. He says, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So what is it we're talking about? These same three temptations that are going to face e each and every one of us, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life were present right there in the, in the garden. First of all, she saw that it was good to eat. That's the lust of the flesh, right? And then she saw that it was pleasant to look at. That's the lust of the eyes. And then she saw that it would make her wise, and that's the pride of life. And so in each and every one of our lives, there's going to be these same temptations. And we may not see it exactly, oh, I'd never go in the garden and eat of that fruit. But yet when we realize that it's still that same temptation, it just presented in a different way. Each and every one of us have stumbled, and if we're not careful, we're going to stumble again. Is that all right? So this original act of disobedience we talk about as being the fall of mankind. And what I mean by that is that it didn't just affect Adam and Eve. It affects each and every one of us. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 says, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. One man, sin came into the world, and with that death goes on to say that death passed upon all men for that all have died. And I just want to say that sometimes we think that we're going to have us just do something and it's not going to affect anybody else, but each of us in one way or another is connected to somebody else and our sin is going to affect somebody else. If, if I do something, it's going to affect my wife and it's going to affect my children. If you do something, it's going to affect your friends and it's going to affect somebody so that not only does it affect you, but it could affect somebody else for all of eternity. And you may repent and you may get back to God, but remember that you have a responsibility because we are our brother's keepers. And we do have a responsibility for our children and for those around us. So it's very important that we understand that every day, every decision that I make is vital, not only for myself, but for others as well. Sin affects the body, the soul, and the spirit. And as soon as they'd eaten, they knew they were guilty. And God said the penalty was death. God, God said the penalty was death. God said it. God is a God that cannot lie. God is a God whose truth. And God said that if you, if you eat, if you sin, you're going to die. I'm sure that there is no doubt that they cringed and they waited for death. I'm sure that no doubt they stood vulnerable. They were naked. They were guilty. They were without defense. They had no reason and no hope for anything else. And in the midst of all of that, the greatest miracle, the miracle of mercy and of grace for the first time in all of humanity is experienced. And it's introduced in a process that's called substitution. And with it, there's a blood sacrifice. And it sounds like such a difference of, of what we would expect, but yet this very harsh experience is exactly what was the very re minimum requirement for them not to die. Genesis chapter 3, verse 21 says, Un Unto Adam also and to his wife did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them. Blood was shed in the garden. If you study before then, they were all herbivores. They all ate herbs. But now all of a sudden, there's the death of an animal. Blood from the animals that God had slain, he makes Adam and Eve coats to cover their shame. And that was their nakedness. But even more than that, more than that vulnerability, was the shedding of blood that afforded them a covering for their spiritual condition. And that was where the covering of that blood really, I mean, yes, the blood is dripping down on, the, on, on them through, the, through that dead animal skin that's covering them. But that blood that's covering them is actually the very saving power of their life. Because at that point, the death of that animal became the substitution that would temporarily put off their own death. So that Jesus, or God said that in that day you're going to die, but now they no longer have to die on that day. And this is the first instance of blood sacrifice. God's instituting the shedding of blood as atonement for sins. Man's redemption for sin has always involved the shedding of blood. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood or cleansed. And without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. 
So this blood, it was a substitution for their sins, and it would be repeated time and time again in the Old Testament. In fact, there would be a law that would be established where this would take place on a regular basis and this shedding of blood and this sacrificing of animals. And we look at that today and we say, how could that possibly be? And it seems so barbaric. But remember that it had to, if there, there was no shedding of blood, there is no existence of humanity at all. And so everything that man depends on really hinges upon the fact that there can be a substitute and there can be a blood sacrifice. And that's the very reason that we have life today is because of that blood sacrifice. And ultimately, there's a better plan, and it's fulfilled in a perfect man. And that man is the man, Christ Jesus. And the perfect plan takes place upon a place called Calvary and on a tree where he's crucified and where his blood now can become the atoning, saving blood that is going to make a difference in your life and in my life. And that's the plan of salvation, and that's the better plan. And that's the plan I, I want to spend just a few more minutes talking to you about tonight. God spoke of this better plan in Genesis chapter 3, verse 14. The Lord God said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly shalt thou go, and thou shalt eat, all the day, eat dust all the days of thy life. And then he goes on and says, and this is where the first promise really comes into the word of God. And he says, and I will put enmity or hatred or even a war between her seed, between thee and the woman. So between the devil and between the woman, there's going to be this enmity and this battle and this friction that's going to go on throughout the, the, the ages and the generations. And he said, between your seed and between her seed. Between her offspring and between your offspring, there's going to be this battle and there's going to be this. Yes, now because of the serpent doing this, he had dominion over all the earth. And he's known as the prince and the power of this earth. But we have, as humanity, God has allowed us to have this ability to withstand. And that power of will and that power of choice still gives us the ability to choose and to choose the right way. And so he's saying there's going to be something that's going to come up from her seed that's going to make all the difference in the world. And her seed or her offspring is going to bruise your head. And you're going to bruise his heel. You're going to be an ankle biter. You're going to get his ankle. But in the end, he's going to crush your head. So the seed of the woman is going to crush the head of the serpent. And that was only the first of many promises that's going to talk about this plan of salvation and about the Messiah coming. And what we know today is that Jesus is the seed of the woman that crushed the head of, of Satan. Galatians chapter 4 verse 4 says, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman, made under the law, made of a woman, and made under the law. This is the fulfillment of that very promises in Genesis chapter 15. He said, To redeem them that were under the law, to buy them back from that curse, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So this is the very fulfillment of what Jesus said in Genesis is now being fulfilled in Galatians. It actually took place before then. It's when the Messiah was born into the world. We call it Christmas. And we know the story of Christmas. Let me remind you just a little bit about what this Christmas is really all about. It's about something called an incarnation. Now, incarnation is a flower, but that's really not what we're talking about. Carnal is something that refers to the flesh. If you're a carnivore, you eat flesh. Okay, so carnal means flesh, so it's putting something in the flesh or putting something in a body. So the incarnation is when the Spirit of God is going to come and dwell within a man. And so it's a fancy word, but all it really means is that God's going to become a man. God's going to take this place and this hope and this plan that we have. And Genesis speaks about this, and it says that it's going to involve a woman, and it's going to involve the seed of a woman. Other prophecies said that she's going to be a virgin. She's, not, she's going to be a devout girl with tremendous character. And God is going to find this woman in that obscure village of Nazareth. And Luke chapter 1, the story, as you know, from just a month ago, ago, says, And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. You're seeing an angel. He says, Don't be afraid. Thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son and shalt call his name Jesus. That sounds good, doesn't it? Goes on to say, she'll be great, she'll be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Mary says, okay, that's great, I'm of the seed of David, you know, this all sounds like it's possible, there's only one problem. And then the next verse she says, how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? I think we have one thing that's missing here, I don't have a husband. And the angel answered and said unto her, 
The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Who's the father of, of Jesus? The Holy Ghost. The father of Jesus is the Holy Ghost. The father of Jesus is the Spirit of God. The Father of Jesus is the Spirit of God because God is the Father of this one who is going to be called the Son of God. Okay? So we understand now that this, the Father is going to be God, then God is the Spirit, and that Spirit is going to now indwell. He's going to overshadow Mary, and that this offspring is going to be known as the Son of God. This very unique person, he's going to be known as the Son of Man because he's going to be of the seed of of man he's going to have a woman mary that's going to be his mother but he's also going to be known as the son of god because he's not going to have a human father but the very spirit of god is going to be his father and remember right well we already talked about what god is god is a spirit and god is omnipotent and god is omnipresent well that is the very presence that is going to be within this person that is going to be known as jesus he's going to have a dual nature He's going to be the son of man, and he's also going to be the son of God. He's going to be both God and man. In fact, he's going to be God himself. And there are scriptures that verify and that prove this. But first, let's talk about him as a man. As a man, he was hungry. As a man, he thirsted. On, on the cross, he said, I thirst. As a man, he was tired and he was sleepy. In fact, he was in the middle of a storm and he was sound asleep. That wasn't God that was asleep. That was a man that was asleep. As a man, he was tempted 40 days in the wilderness, but yet the Bible tells us he was also without sin. As a man, he was wounded. As a man, he was bruised, and as a man, he died. Remember, I told you earlier that God is immortal. So as a man, he died. So he was the son of man, and the Bible consistently reveals to us that he is the son of man. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5 says, For there is one God. How many? There's one God, and there's also one mediator between God and man. There's one that's going to be able to bring me into that right relationship with, with God, and that is the man, Christ Jesus. So Jesus Christ is a man, and he is fully man. He isn't just kind of a man or just a little bit of a man, but he is 100% of a man, a man that can live and breathe and, and bleed and eat and die. And he's also a man that can be raised up again from the dead. And that's the beauty of what we're going to talk about later. But today, he was a man, and he is also God. He is Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. Yeah, I was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And then in Matthew chapter 1, verse 22, the angel fulfills this. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child. We talked about that, right? And shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name. It was supposed to be Jesus, but here it's Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So he's the son of God, but he's also God with us. Because he's God, but he's God in the flesh. In fact, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 shows us just why this would be. Where it says, to wit or to know or to understand that God was in Christ. God was in that man. It wasn't just a man, but God was in that man. He didn't just have the Holy Ghost like you and I can have the Holy Ghost, but God was in him. God was in him, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us, you and I, the same ministry of reconciliation. That's why he could go and he could say, Philip, have I been so long time with you and you haven't known me? If you've seen me, the man, you've seen the Father. And that's why he can say, I and my Father are one. Because there is only one God, and that God was fully resident, incarnate, in the very body and in the very personhood of Jesus Christ. There's only one man, and there's only one that's within that body that is a person, and that is the person of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ, he's fully God, and he's fully man. He's both God and man. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 says, For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. That's talking about a man, isn't it? And his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God. So that he's not only the Son, but he's also the Mighty God. And he's not only the Son, but he's also the 
everlasting father. Where is all that resident? In the very person of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is not the second person in the Godhead. Jesus Christ is the father. Jesus Christ is the son. And Jesus Christ is the Holy Ghost. Because he is the very presence of God and that very representation of God with us. First Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. What are you talking about? I'm talking about not a mystery that you can't understand, but something that's so awe-inspiring that you look at and you go, Wow, man, that is so amazing. How, how God could you even do such a thing? For unto us, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Right there it says God was in the flesh, right? And we saw that flesh, but we also saw God in the flesh. God was justified in the spirit. There's only one subject with all this. God was seen of angels. God was preached unto the Gentiles. God was believed on in the world, and God was received up into glory. When was God received up into glory? When Jesus was resurrected back up and the... 500 or so witnesses saw him being ascending up into heaven. And the angel said, as you see him go up into heaven, he's going to come back in the same way. And that was when God was received up into heaven. So we see this, and I just want to wrap this up with telling you all this is fulfilled in what we know as the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I want to close with one more scripture, and that's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 4. And the Apostle Paul wrote, and he said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. I want to tell you the good news. That's what gospel really means. I would declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. I've already told you this. I've already preached it to you. Which also you received. You already heard it. And not only that, but you believed it. And wherein you now stand. You're all believers. And I'm looking at believers right here. And just like the Apostle Paul, if you want to stand at this time, and I want you to think about this. And let's stand as, as we're looking at this as the Apostle Paul, and, and he's, he's writing this to the church at Corinth, but he's really writing it to you and to me and each of us tonight. Moreover, moreover brethren, I declare unto you the gospel and the good news, which I preached unto you, which also you've received, and wherein you stand, but which all, by which also you are saved. This is how we're going to be saved, by this gospel. It's going to be something that the Apostle Paul is going to talk about, but before then, he says, if you keep in memory, you got to keep on remembering what I've told you, what I preached unto you. It goes on because there's this other possibility, unless you've believed in vain. There is a possibility that even though we are believers and even though we have this great Acts 238 salvation in our lives, we got to make sure that we love that and that we remember it and that we embrace it and that we understand that it's all really about this good news of Jesus Christ and that there was a time when the fall of man has impacted each and every one of us but now we have a hope and we have a savior and we have a plan of salvation and he goes on to tell us exactly one more time what this plan of salvation is all about he says for I delivered unto you first of all that which also I received how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures I'm so glad today to know and I never want to forget that Christ died for my sins. And Christ died for your sins. And that's really why we're here. And he goes on to say, because it wasn't just that he died, but also that he was buried. And that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Substitution. He took my place. Say that with me. He took my place. He took my place. This great message of substitution is that he took my place. Make it personal and never forget that it really is personal. And let's keep it that way, can we, tonight? Do you love this word of God? Are you so glad today to know Jesus Christ and all that he's done? Let's pray. Mighty God, I love you and I love your word. And I'm so glad today to know, Lord, that you have been a good God and a mighty God. And, Lord, you've got such a great plan for us, your people. The revelation of Jesus Christ and all, Lord, that we know today as the people of the name of